Human Immortality by John McTaggart, Ellis McTaggart I do not propose to offer here any arguments in support of the positive assertion that men are immortal. I believe that such arguments exist, and that, in spite of the difficulty and obscurity of the subject, they are of sufficient strength to justify a belief in our immortality. But to expound these arguments would require an elaborate and lengthy treatise of technical metaphysics, for they could only be proved by a demonstration of some idealist theory of the fundamental nature of reality. My present design is merely to consider some arguments against immortality, which have been based on certain facts of ordinary observation and on certain results of physical science. I shall endeavor to show that those arguments are invalid and that the presumption against immortality, which they have produced in many people, should be discarded. It is better to speak of the immortality of the self, or of men, than of the immortality of the soul. The latter phrase suggests untenable views, for, in speaking of the identity of a man during different periods of his bodily life, we do not usually say that he is the same soul, but the same self, or the same man. And to use a different word when we are discussing the prolongation of that identity after death calls up the idea of an identity less perfect than that which lasts through a bodily life. The form in which the question is put thus implies that the answer is to be in some degree negative, that a man is not as much himself after death as he is before it, even if something escapes from complete destruction. Moreover, it is customary, unfortunately, to say that a man has a soul, not that he is one. Now, if our question is put in the form, has man an immortal soul? An affirmative answer would be absurd. So far as it would mean anything, it would mean that the man himself was the body, or something which died with the body, at any rate, was not immortal, and that something not himself, which he owned during life, was set free at his death to continue existing on its own account. For these reasons, it seems better not to speak of the soul, and to put our question in the form, are men immortal? What reasons are there for supposing that our existence is only temporary? I see around me bodies which behave so like my own that I conclude that they are related to other conscious selves in the same way that my body is related to myself. But from time to time these bodies are observed to cease to behave in this way and to become motionless unless moved from the outside. Shortly after this, the body dissolves into its constituent parts. Its form and identity as a body are completely destroyed. The experience of the past leads me to the conclusion that the same thing will happen in the future to every human body now existing, including my own. How does this affect the question of my existence? It is clear that if I am a mere effect of my body, a form of its activity, I shall cease when the body ceases. And it is also clear that, if I could not exist without this particular body, then the destruction of the body will be a sign that I have ceased to exist. But besides death, there is another characteristic of nature which tends to make us doubt our immortality. Of all the things around us, from a pebble to a solar system, science tells us that they are transitory. Each of them arose out of something else, 
Each of them will pass away into something else. What is a man that he should be exempt from this universal law? Thus, we have three questions to consider. One, is myself an activity of my body? Two, is my present body an essential condition of the existence of myself? Three, is there any reason to suppose that myself does not share all the transitory character which I recognize in all the material objects around me? With regard to the first of these questions, it is certain, to begin with, that my body influences myself much and continuously. A large part of my mental life is made up of sensations. Sensations are continually produced in connection with changes in the sense organs of my body, and, so far as we know, they are never produced in any other way. And the course of my thoughts and emotions can be profoundly affected by the state of my body. If my body gets no food for 24 hours, they will be affected in one way. If I introduce whiskey or opium into it, they will be affected another way. If my body is very fatigued, the ordinary current of my mental life will be entirely suspended in profound sleep or completely broken by dreams. If any of these processes is carried far enough, my body dies, and I cease to have any relation to it for the future, which is certainly an important event for me, whether I survive it or not. It is equally certain that the mind acts on the body. My limbs, on many occasions, move according to my will, and the normal behavior of the body can be altered by the mind as much as the normal behavior of the mind can be altered by the body. Grief or fear or anger can produce bodily illness and even death. Now, each of these groups of events, the effects of body on mind and of mind on body, could be explained on the hypothesis that the self and the body were two separate realities, neither of which was the mere product of the other, though each affected the other and caused changes in it. And it might be thought that this would be the most natural conclusion to adopt, since the action appears to be reciprocal, mind acting on body as much as body acts on mind. There is always, however, a very strong tendency to adopt the view that the self is a mere activity of the body, or, at any rate, to hold that the only escape from this view lies in accepting some form of revealed religion, which denies it. The cause of this tendency is, in the first place, the incomplete nature of the explanation which would be furnished by the recognition of the self and its body as independent realities. Footnote. By independent, I do not here mean isolated or unconnected realities, but such as stand on equal footing, so that, though each is connected with the other, neither is subordinate to the other. End footnote. All ultimate explanation endeavors to reduce the universe to a unity. The self is spirit, the body is matter. Spirit and matter taken as independent realities are very heterogeneous to one another. It is evident that a theory which makes either spirit or matter to be the sole reality in the universe introduces a greater degree of unity than a theory which makes them to be equally real. Monism, then, whether it be materialism or idealism, is more attractive to the majority of inquirers than dualism is. We must now consider the various causes which tend to make a materialistic monism more plausible than an idealistic monism, and which impel us to the conclusion that matter is the only reality, 
Well, human spirit is nothing more than one of the activities which characterize matter, when it is in the special form of a human body. It is immaterial for our present purpose whether the adherents of this view suppose matter to exist as a substance to which these activities belong, or whether they say that the activities are the matter. The difference is insignificant, although the second alternative is sometimes put forward as a great improvement on the first. The essential point is that the spiritual is, in either case, reduced to a temporary form of an activity whose fundamental nature is non-spiritual. One of these causes is the fact so continually pressed upon the notice of every man that the nature of matter is almost entirely independent of his will. I cannot create matter, and there are narrow limits to the extent to which I can alter it. I cannot make into bread the stone which I see and touch, however passionately I may desire that it should be bread, however serious the consequences to myself and others of its remaining a stone. A stone, it remains. By a transition which is natural, though illegitimate, we tend to believe that whatever is so independent of our will must be independent of us altogether. To some extent, indeed, the will can affect matter, but the amount of its effects is comparatively insignificant. All the exertions of human beings can only affect the surface of the earth, and that very slightly. On the other hand, matter seems far more powerful in its influence on spirit. The diminution of the temperature of a single planet is an absurdly trivial episode in astronomy. But if the planet were our Earth, it would put an end to the only conditions under which, as far as our observation goes, it is possible for spirit to exist. Since spirit, then, appears so much weaker than matter when they are taken separately, is it strange that, when an attempt is made to reduce the one to the other, it is spirit that is called on to give way? In matter, too, we can observe a unity and a persistence which may belong to spirit, but does not obviously belong to it. Spirit we only know in the form of separate individuals, set in the midst of matter, which forms the only means by which they are able to communicate with one another. No human spirit has ever, as far as we know, been open to observation for much more than a hundred years, and the lower animals only slightly exceed this limit. Matter forms one vast system which history informs us has existed for thousands of years, while science extends the period to millions. And again, the amount of knowledge which science gives us about matter is far greater than the amount which it gives us about spirit. On the one side is the whole vast extent of the physical sciences. On the other side, we have only psychology, and not the whole of psychology. For the psychophysical side of that science deals as much with matter as it does with spirit. All this increases the apparent importance of matter and seems to render it more probable that matter, rather than spirit, is the sole reality. Spirit, then, would be the way in which matter behaves under certain circumstances. And, in support of this, it may be said that the activity of matter does take different forms. The same energy, science informs us, which sometimes shows itself as heat, shows itself at other times as motion, or, again, as electricity. And this same energy, it is asserted by the materialist, is transformed under other circumstances, when it is found in the human body, into thought, will, and emotion. Certainly, he admits, thought, will, and emotion are not very like heat, motion, and electricity. But then heat, motion, and electricity are not very like one another. 
and if they can all be reduced to this common unity, why should not the forms of consciousness share the same fate? These conclusions depend, it will be seen, on the proposition that matter can exist independently of spirit. For, if this were not so, it would obviously be absurd to explain away the separate reality of spirit by making it one of the temporary forms which the activity of matter takes. Deeper inquiry will, I think, show us that there is no reason to believe that matter does exist. If this is the case, we cannot be entitled to consider the self as the activity of its body. Of what nature is the matter supposed to be which, it is asserted, can exist independently of spirit? It is not conceived as having all the qualities which, in ordinary language, we ascribe to matter. We say of an orange that it is soft, yellow, sweet, and odorous, but these qualities are not held to belong to the orange when it is not being observed. In strictness, they are not held to be qualities of the orange at all, but effects excited in the observer by qualities of the orange. The orange is no more yellow when no one sees it than it is desired when no one knows of its existence. But the object is conceived as having other qualities which really do belong to it, and give it that nature which it has independently of observation, and if no one observes it. Its size, its shape, its position in space, its motion, and its impenetrability are of this nature. It is these qualities, or others of the same nature, which have the power, under certain circumstances, of exciting in the observer the sensations of softness, yellowness, and the like. The qualities which are held really to belong to matter are often called its primary qualities. The others are called its secondary qualities, though, on this theory, it is scarcely correct to call them qualities of the object at all. Matter, then, is held to be extended, to have position, and to be capable of motion, independently of observation. It is also impenetrable, that is, no two pieces of matter can occupy the same position in space. But it has no color, it is neither hard nor soft, it has no taste, no smell, and no sound. This is matter as it is conceived in physical science. It may be said also to be the ordinary conception, for although we speak of an orange as yellow, yet the idea that it is not yellow in the dark is generally known and generally accepted. What reason can be given for a belief in the existence of matter? I conceive that such a belief can only be defended on the ground that it is a legitimate inference from our sensations. This view has been contested, but I believe that the objection to it rests on a misunderstanding. It has been said, and with perfect truth, that my belief in the existence of matter does not arise as an inference from my sensations. I do not first become aware of my sensations and then infer the existence of an orange. On the contrary, I am aware of the existence of the orange first. If I am studying psychology or am doubtful of the validity of my knowledge, I may then consider the sensations of sight, touch, and so on, connected with my knowledge of the object. But in most cases, I never do consider the sensations at all. And there are young children who are quite aware of the existence of a material world, but who have never realized that they have sensations. These facts are sufficient to refute the view which has sometimes been held, that our belief in a material world arises as an inference from our sensations. 
but they are quite irrelevant to the question now before us, whether our belief in a material world must not be justified, if it is to be justified at all, as an inference from our sensations. And when such facts are used, as not infrequently happens, as bearing on this question, it involves a very serious confusion. The belief in a material world requires justification. It is natural in every sense that everyone who has not reflected on the subject holds the belief as a matter of course, together with many of those who have reflected on it. But it is not inevitable. It is possible to disbelieve it. Many philosophers have done so. And there is, at any rate, nothing obviously self-contradictory in its denial. Barclay's theory on the subject, to take only one out of many theories which deny the existence of matter, whether true or false, is not obviously self-contradictory. Since disbelief in the existence of matter is neither impossible nor contradictory, the question becomes inevitable. What is the justification of the belief? And it becomes more pressing because in many cases our judgments as to the existence of matter are admitted to be wrong. In the first place, the quite unreflective consciousness has no more doubt that the world of matter is colored than it has that the world of matter is extended. But either this or the more reflective judgments of science in the modern world must be wrong here, since they disagree. Again, if a man who sees a cloak hanging up by moonlight believes that he sees before him the body of a dead friend, it is obvious that he has completely mistaken the character of the matter before him. And if our judgments as to what the external object is are so often wrong, we have little justification for assuming, without inquiry, that our judgment that there is an external object is ever right. There is a stronger case than this, for in dreams we do not only make wrong judgments as to the nature of matter, but as to the existence of matter. If a believer in the existence of matter dreams that he sees a rock's egg, he has no more doubts during his dream that the rock's egg exists as independent matter than he doubts during waking life that his table exists as independent matter. And yet, on waking, he will admit that in his dream he was neither observing a rock's egg nor any other really existing matter which he mistook for a rock's egg. Not only was his dream belief, this is a rock's egg, mistaken, but his dream belief, this is independently existing matter, was also mistaken. And, if this is mistaken, it is mere credulity to trust his belief in the table's existence without examination. For that belief is no stronger and no more evident than the other had been previously. On what can we base a justification for the belief in the independent existence of matter? Nothing is available except the sensations. They are there and they are certain. We never believe that we are observing matter unless we experience sensations more or less analogous to the qualities we believe to exist in the matter. We may not be conscious of the sensations as such at all. Indeed, as was said above, in the majority of cases, we never are conscious of them. But whenever we look for them on such occasions, we find them and the sensations are certain. I may be wrong in believing that matter exists independently of me, but the suggestion that I am wrong in believing I have a sensation is absurd. The belief is not sufficiently separable from the sensation for the possibility of error. I may, of course, 
be wrong in believing that I had a sensation in the past, for memory may deceive me, and I may be wrong in the general terms which I apply to a sensation when I attempt to classify it and to describe it to others. But my knowledge that I am having the sensation which I am having is one of those ultimate certainties which it is impossible either to prove or to deny. And we find that although the sensations are generally ignored as sensations, when the correctness of the judgment about the matter is not doubted, yet as soon as I myself or other people entertain a doubt of the correctness of the judgment, the situation is changed. If it is suggested that what I believe to be an experience of matter of a certain sort is really a dream or a delusion, I fall back on the sensations which I have experienced and consider whether they can be accounted for on any other hypothesis than that of the existence of the matter in question. If they cannot, I consider that I was right in my judgment that the matter did exist. And we must act in the same way if a doubt arises, not merely of the correctness of our judgments that this or that matter exists, but of the correctness of all judgments that matter of any sort exists. The fact which it is impossible to deny is that we have these sensations. Are we entitled to conclude from this that the material world really exists and that the natural judgment that it does exist, which is not, however, as we have seen, an inevitable or universal judgment, is correct? It is evident that the sensations are not themselves the matter in question. A sensation is not matter, and it cannot exist apart from the self to whom it belongs. It can have no independent existence. But the sensations, since they begin to exist, must have causes. Footnote. This step might not be accepted by anyone who denied the universal validity of causality. A thinker, however, who denied the universal validity of causality could not, as far as I can see, have the least justification for a belief in the existence of matter. End footnote. Now, it cannot be said to be obviously impossible that all the causes of my sensations should lie within my own nature. It is certain that they do not lie within that part of my own nature of which I am conscious, for I am not conscious of producing my sensations. But it might be said, as Leibniz has said, that all my sensations arise out of the depths of my own unconscious nature, and that when a self has once come into existence, it is as independent of outside influences in its sensations as a clock, when once wound up, is in striking. But there are difficulties in the way of this view into which we have no time to enter, and I do not wish to lay any weight on the possibility of its truth. I am prepared to admit, what seems to me by far the more probable view, that all my sensations have causes which are not myself nor anything in myself. Such causes must, in each case, be merely part causes. I am unquestionably one of the causes of my own sensations, for if I did not exist, my sensations also would not exist. It may thus be admitted that my sensations make it at any rate, highly probable that some reality exists, which is not myself or anything within myself, but exists independently of me. But we have not got to matter. A reality which exists independently of me need not be matter. It might, for example, be another spirit. We do not call anything matter unless it possesses the primary qualities of matter, given above. These qualities correspond to certain sensations, or 
elements in sensations, and the presence of the sensation in me is held to prove the existence of the corresponding quality in the material object. But is this legitimate? The independent reality has been admitted to be the part cause of these sensations, but that does not prove it is like them. Causes do not necessarily resemble their effects. Happiness in A does not resemble the misery which it may cause to the envious B. An angry man does not resemble a slammed door. A ray of sunshine does not resemble a faded watercolor. And on this very theory, the external causes of all mental events do not resemble those events. When I see a sphere of red-hot iron, I have sensations of form, sensations of color, and, if I am near enough, a feeling of pain. Now, the ordinary theory of matter makes the matter the cause of the sensations of color and of the feeling of pain as much as of the sensations of form. Yet, it denies that the matter is red or painful. Here, therefore, is an external cause of mental events which does not resemble them. It is therefore impossible to fall back on the principle that the external cause of mental events always resembles them. And what other principle have we to justify us in ascribing the primary qualities to the external causes of the sensations? Footnote. It must be noticed that the resemblance which the theory attributes to the sensations and their external causes is very limited. The causes are not sensations, nor are their qualities sensations. All that can be said is that, in some way not too easy to define, certain predicates of the causes resemble the content of some of the sensations which are the effects of those causes. But it is not necessary for my argument to follow out the ambiguities and difficulties which follow from this elaborate combination of similarity and difference between sensations and matter. End footnote. The distinction between the primary and secondary qualities renders the theory of the existence of matter less tenable than it would otherwise be. In the first place, there is the inconsistency, which we have just noticed, of asserting that we can argue from some of our sensations to a resemblance in their causes, and not from others. If our perception of the secondary qualities varies from time to time and from individual to individual, so also does our perception of the primary qualities. If our perception of the primary qualities exhibits a certain uniformity from time to time and from individual to individual, so also does our perception of the secondary qualities. And, in the second place, Matter, while extended and impenetrable, is destitute both of color and of hardness, since these are secondary qualities. Now, the sensations of extension and impenetrability only come to us by sight and touch. When they come by sight, they are inevitably conjoined with sensations of color. When they come by touch they are invariably conjoined with sensations of hardness. We cannot even imagine to ourselves a sensation which gives extension without giving either color or hardness. Thus, the theory which makes the external causes of our sensations material reaches a climax of inconsistency. Its one defense was the principle that the causes of the sensations must resemble the sensations they cause. But now it turns out that that which the causes are to resemble is a mere abstraction from our sensations, a naked extension, which is so far from being a sensation which we experience that we cannot even imagine what such a sensation would be like. Is it possible to avoid this inconsistency 
by dropping the distinction between primary and secondary qualities? Shall we say that matter has not only shape, size, position, motion, and impenetrability, but also color, hardness, smell, and taste? This view certainly avoids some of the objections to the more ordinary theory. It does not make an arbitrary and a gratuitous difference in the treatment of two sets of qualities, and it gives matter a nature not utterly unlike our experience, and not utterly unimaginable by us. But, on the other hand, the theory would no longer have the support of physical science, for that science treats matter as devoid of the secondary qualities, and it endeavors to show that the primary qualities of matter, under certain circumstances, excite in us the sensations of the secondary qualities. Of course, the independent existence and ultimate nature of matter is a question for metaphysics, and not for science. And therefore, a metaphysical theory that matter possesses the secondary qualities as well as the primary cannot be upset by the fact that science, working from its own more superficial point of view, finds it convenient to treat matter as possessing only the primary qualities. If science keeps to its own sphere, it cannot clash with any metaphysical theory. If attempts are made to treat its results as if they were metaphysical truths, they have no claim to validity in this sphere, and a metaphysical theory is none the worse for being incompatible with these misapplications. But the theory that matter exists depended very largely for its plausibility on the illegitimate support which it obtained by taking science as if it were metaphysics. And if it loses this support, as it must in the suggested new form, it loses indeed no real strength, but much of what caused people to believe it. As has already been said, the fact that physical science treats matter as independent of spirit, and that physical science forms a vast system, coherent, accepted, and, from its own standpoint, irrefutable, has done much to strengthen the belief that matter, at least, must be real, and that, if one of the two must be explained by the other, it is spirit which must go, and matter which must stay. The inference is quite illegitimate, since nothing in physical science touches, or can touch, the question of the independent existence of matter. But it is an inference which is frequently made. And when the theory of the independent existence of matter defines the nature of that matter in a manner completely different from the definitions of physical science, it will no longer be able to gain apparent support in this way. Nor does the amended theory, while less inconsistent than the original form, altogether avoid inconsistency. The red-hot sphere of iron is now admitted not only to be a sphere independent of any observer, but to be red independent of any observer. But the pain still remains. It is not asserted that the iron is painful, although it causes me pain. Now, the pain is a result produced in the observer, which is quite as real as the sensations of form and color, and quite as independent of the observer's will. It is likewise just as uniform. The iron will not give me the sensations except under certain conditions. I shall not see it to be red, for example, if I am blind or have my eyes shut. And, under certain conditions, quite as definite, it will inevitably give me the feeling of pain. Yet nothing resembling the mental effect is attributed to the cause in this case. Why should a difference be made between this case and the others? And, even if we limit ourselves to sensations, the amended theory does not escape inconsistency. For, even if the secondary qualities are predicated of matter, 
it remains impossible to assert that matter is like the sensations which it causes. These sensations change for me from moment to moment. If I look at a thing under one set of conditions, as to light and shade, I get one sensation of color from it. If I change the conditions next minute, I get quite a different sensation. And if two men look at it simultaneously under the different conditions of light and shade, they will have, simultaneously, the two different sensations of color, which I had, successively. Now, it is impossible to suppose that the object has at once two different colors. And, if it has only one, then that color must differ at least from one of the two sensations experienced by the two observers, since these sensations differ from one another. The same is the case with the other secondary qualities, and it is also the case with the primary qualities. Two men who look at a cube from different positions simultaneously have two quite different sensations of its shape, not merely numerically different, but sensations which do not resemble one another. Yet, an object cannot have two shapes at once, and each of these men would, under normal circumstances, agree about the shape of the object, although they started from non-resembling sensations. It is clear, therefore, that the shape attributed to the object cannot resemble the sensations of shape which it causes, since they do not resemble one another. Now, if it is once admitted that the qualities attributed to the external object do not resemble the qualities of the sensations it causes, we have no reason to attribute those qualities to it at all. The only reason we had for supposing the causes of our sensations to have these qualities was the supposed resemblance of the qualities to the sensations. But now it becomes clear that the qualities attributed to the causes, although partially resembling the sensations, do not resemble them completely. It follows that a cause of a sensation may lack some of the qualities of the sensation it causes. And, in that case, there seems to be no reason for denying the possibility of its being quite different and having none of the qualities in question. It may be replied, no doubt, that it is nevertheless possible that the causes of the sensations do possess qualities partially resembling the sensations. The causes exist and must have some qualities. And it may be these qualities which they have, and so they may be entitled to the name of matter. But such a possibility would be far too vague to give any support to the theory that matter exists. They may possess these qualities, for there is no reason why a cause should not resemble its effect in certain respects, but there is no reason to believe that they do possess them, or that their possession of them is in the slightest degree probable. A man who boils a lobster red may have a red face. There is nothing to prevent it. But his action in causing the redness of the lobster gives us no reason to suppose that his face is red. Footnote. The statement that the bare possibility of the external causes being material still remains open must be taken as referring only to the arguments in this chapter. I believe that further consideration should convince us, for reasons somewhat analogous to those of Hegel and Lotze, that all substance must possess certain characteristics which are essential to the nature of spirit and incompatible with the nature of matter. If this view is right, a question beyond the purpose of this book to investigate, the existence of matter would be positively disproved. End footnote. The result is that matter is in the same position as the Gorgons or the Harpies. Its existence is a bare possibility to which it would be foolish to attach the least importance, since there is nothing to make it at all preferable to any other hypothesis, however wild. If we ask, then, 
of what reality the vast mass of knowledge holds true, which science and everyday life give us about matter, we must reply that it holds true of various sensations, which occur to various men, and of the laws according to which these sensations are connected. So that, from the presence of certain sensations in me, I can infer that, under certain conditions, I shall or shall not experience certain other sensations, and can also infer that, under certain conditions, other men will or will not experience certain sensations. It will be objected that this is not what common experience and science profess to do. When we say that this bottle contains champagne and this vinegar, we are not talking about our sensations. And physical science deals with such things as planets, acids, and nerves, none of which are sensations. It is quite true that it is usual to express the conclusions of common experience and of science in terms which assume the independent existence of matter. Most people in the past have believed that matter does exist independently. Our language has been molded by this belief. And now it is easier and shorter to express our conclusions in this way. Besides this, most people at present do hold the metaphysical opinion that matter exists independently and tend to express themselves accordingly. But the conclusions remain just as true, if we take the view that matter does not exist. Something has been changed, no doubt, but what has been changed is no part either of common experience or science, but a theory of metaphysics which forms no part of either. And so we sacrifice neither the experience of everyday life nor the results of science by denying the existence of matter. We only sacrifice a theory of metaphysics, which we have already seen cannot be justified. I say, in ordinary language, that this is champagne and this is vinegar. Supposing that there is neither champagne nor vinegar as matter existing independently of observation, but that it remains true that a certain group of sensations of sight and smell is a trustworthy indication that I can secure a certain taste by performing certain actions, and that another group of sensations of sight and smell is a trustworthy indication that I can secure a different taste by performing similar actions. Does not this leave a perfectly definite and coherent meaning to the experience of everyday life, which fits every detail of that experience as well as the more common theory does, and only differs from it on a question of metaphysics? It is the same with science. Every observation made by science, every uniformity which is established, every statement as to the past or the future which it asserted, would still have its meaning. The observations would inform us of what had been experienced. The uniformities would tell us the connections of various experiences. The statements as to the past and future would tell us what has been or will be experienced, or would be so if the necessary conditions were present. What more does science tell us? Or what more could it desire to tell us? If the language in which scientific results are generally expressed does seem to tell us more, and to imply the independent existence of matter, that is not science, but metaphysics. The unconscious and uncritical metaphysics of ordinary language, and its rejection does not involve the rejection or the distrust of a single result of science. Science requires, no doubt, that experience should exhibit certain uniformities, so that a certain experience can safely be taken as an indication of what other experiences will follow it under certain conditions. But this proves nothing as to the independent existence of matter. If the external causes of my sensations, and I myself, have a constant nature, the sensations which are their joint result will exhibit uniformities. And a non-material cause can have a constant nature just as easily as a material cause could have. 
Science also requires that experience should have a community of nature between different persons, so that it shall be possible for us to infer from any experience what the experience of another person would be under conditions more or less similar. This again can be explained as easily without matter as with it. If my nature and that of other persons were not more or less the same, our experience would not be similar, whatever the nature of its external cause. But if our natures resemble one another, then it is obvious that the action on us of the same external cause would produce results which resembled one another. The denial of matter, it must also be noticed, does not lead us towards solipsism. That is to say, to the denial by each individual of all reality except himself. The arguments which prove that my sensations must have causes which are not myself nor in myself, but are some other reality, lose none of their force if we decide that these causes are not of a material nature. And the other arguments against solipsism, the consideration of which is a part of our present object, are just as strong on the hypothesis that matter does not exist. It might be supposed that the theory I have been advocating was a form of agnosticism. Agnosticism holds that we can know nothing but phenomena. Beneath these phenomena lies a reality on which they are based, but of this reality, agnosticism declares, we can know nothing. If we only know of the external causes of our sensations, that they do not cause the sensations, have we not, in effect, taken up the agnostic theory? that the reality on which phenomena depend is unknowable? But this is not the case. Agnosticism says that we can know nothing whatever of the reality behind the phenomena. And, in saying this, it contradicts itself. For it asserts that such a reality exists, and that it stands in certain relations to the phenomena. Thus, we do know something about it and it is therefore not the case that we can know nothing about it. But the theory which I have put forward does not say that we can know nothing about the causes of sensations. It only says that we do not know that they are like the sensations they cause. Even if this should destroy all knowledge of them except of the fact that they were causes, it would not be a general assertion of the impossibility of any knowledge of them and so there would be no inconsistency in saying that we knew they were causes. To know M of anything is inconsistent with being unable to know anything about it, but it is quite consistent with knowing nothing about it except M. Nor does it follow that we know nothing else about the causes of our sensations if we cannot conclude that they resemble these sensations. It might be possible, as various philosophers have maintained, to determine the qualities which must belong to every substance in virtue of its being a substance. And it might turn out that this could give us a considerable knowledge of the nature of these substances. We might, for example, be led to the conclusion that all substance was spirit but we cannot here do more than point out the possibility of such a result. And we have thus, I think, proved our original contention that the self cannot be one of the activities of its own body. If the self were, as such a theory would require it to be, merely a way in which matter behaved under certain circumstances, it would be possible to explain the self satisfactorily in terms of matter, and it would be possible that a state of such things should exist in which those circumstances, which determine the activity of matter to take the form of spirit, occurred nowhere in the universe, which would then be a universe of matter without any consciousness. But so far is this from being the case that, as we now see, we have no reason to suppose that matter exists at all, and to talk of matter existing without consciousness is absurd. Matter is so far from being the sole reality 
of which the self is only an activity, that, taken by itself, it is not a reality at all. The only things which have, in any sense, the qualities attributed to matter are the sensations experienced by selves. In place of an independent reality, we find events in men's minds which are real, indeed, but not an independent reality. Matter is simply our illegitimate inference from these events. This may be put in another way. If my self is one of the activities of my body, then, since what appears as my body is only events in the life of some conscious being, my self must also be events in the life of some conscious being. It is clearly absurd to suppose that I am an activity of my body, as my body is known to myself, for then I should be events in my own life. But it is equally impossible that my self should be one of the activities of its own body as perceived by some other self. In that case, the self, A, would be events in the life of another self, B. But how about B? By the same rule, it also will have to be events in the life of another self. If this self is A, the absurdity will recur in an aggravated form. For then A would be the events which happened in a self which was itself events in A. But if we say that B is events in the life of a third self, C, the same question will arise about C, and so on, without end. If every self is only events in the life of some other self, no self is explicable until we reach the end of an infinite series. That is, no self is explicable at all. And so we are brought back to the conclusion that the self cannot be an activity of its body. I may be thought to have dwelt unnecessarily on this point. Surely, it may be said, it is obvious that the theory that the self is an activity of the body must fall with the theory of the independent existence of matter. Surely no one would maintain that the body only existed for spirit, and, at the same time, that spirit was an activity of body. Yet, this has been done. Men of ability have maintained that what I call matter is nothing but my thoughts and sensations, and, at the same time, that my thoughts and sensations are nothing but an activity of my brain, which, being matter, will itself be thoughts and sensations. The bearing of this discussion on the question of our immortality is that it disproves a hypothesis which would render immortality incredible. If the self was an activity of the body, it would be impossible that it should continue to exist when the body had ceased to exist. We might as well suppose, in that case, that the digestion survived the body, as that the self did. But the body, as we have now seen, only exists for the selves which observe it, and we cannot, therefore, reduce any self to be an activity of its own body. It has been admitted, indeed, that there is reality external to myself, the reality which includes the external part causes of my sensations, although we are not justified in regarding that reality as material. And nothing that we have said excludes the possibility that myself may be a product or activity of some other reality and one which is destined to cease to exist when some change takes place in its cause. But while this view has not been refuted, there is not any reason that I can see why it should be held to be true, or even probable. There is no reason why we should regard ourselves as the product or activity of any other reality whatever, and there is no reason why 
if we did regard them as such products or activities, we should consider them likely to cease. Footnote. It is commonly held that human selves are not products of non-divine realities, but that they are all produced by God. I have given in Some Dogmas of Religion, Chapter 6, the reasons why this view does not seem to me to be necessary. But supposing that they are produced in this way, we should have no ground for supposing that their divine production involved their subsequent destruction, though it is not, of course, incompatible with such destruction. End footnote. If the external reality had been independently existing matter, it would have been different. In that case, there would have been, as we saw above, a strong tendency to regard matter as the only ultimate reality, and the self as an activity of its body. The tendency would not be due to a logical necessity, since the facts, as we have seen, would not be inconsistent with the hypothesis that spirit and matter were independent, though connected, realities. But the tendency would be very strong, owing to our desire to find as much unity as possible in the universe. If the self is an independent reality, it is a non-material reality. And, granted the independent existence of matter, more unity would be gained by denying the independent reality of spirit. But without independently existing matter, the case is changed. No increased unity is gained by making the self a mere activity of something else, unless that something else is already known to exist and to be of a non-spiritual nature. Independently existing matter would, of course, be of a non-spiritual nature. But when we have rejected this, I have no reason to believe that the reality outside myself is non-spiritual. And so, I should gain no increased unity for the universe by denying the independent reality of myself. And again, if the self is an activity of its body, it must be a temporary activity, since the body is only a temporary combination of matter. But if the self were an activity of some non-material reality outside itself, there would be nothing to disprove the permanence of the state of things which produces the self, though, of course, there would equally be nothing which proves that permanence. We must now pass on to our second question. Myself cannot be a form of the activity of my body, but it is still possible that the nature of myself makes the perception of my present body, by myself or other selves, a necessary condition of the existence of myself. In that case, it would be an inevitable inference that when my body dissolves and ceases to be known as a body at all, myself must have ceased also. If A, whenever it exists, is necessarily accompanied by B, then the cessation of B is a sure sign of the cessation of A. What evidence is there in favor of such a view? In the first place, while we have plenty of experience of selves who possess bodies, we have no indubitable experience of selves who exist without bodies or after their bodies have ceased to exist. Besides this, the existence of a self seems to involve the experience of sensations. Without them, the self would have no material for thought, will, or feeling, and it is only in these that the self exists. Now, there seems good reason to suppose that sensations never occur in our minds, at present, without some corresponding modifications of the body. This is certainly the case with normal sensations, and even if the evidence for clairvoyance and thought transference were beyond dispute, it could never prove the possibility of sensation without bodily accompaniments. 
for it could not exclude, indeed it seems rather to suggest, the existence of bodily accompaniments in an obscure and unusual kind. But, after all, these considerations would, at the most, go to show that some body was necessary to myself, and not that its present body was necessary. Have we, after the results already reached, any reason to suppose that the death of the body must indicate anything more than that the self has transferred its manifestations to a new body, and had, therefore, passed from the knowledge of the survivors who had only known it through the old body. The apparent improbability of this lies, I think, simply in our instinctive recurrence to the theory that the self is an activity of the body. In that case, no doubt, it would be impossible that it should be successively connected with two bodies. But that theory we have seen to be untenable. The most that a body can be is an essential accompaniment of the self. And then the supposition that the self has another body would fit the facts quite as well as the supposition that the self had ceased to exist. There seems no reason why such a change should not be instantaneous. But even if it were not so, no additional difficulty would be created. If a body is essential to the action of a self, the self would be in a state of suspended animation, in the interval between its possession of its two bodies, a state which we might almost call one of temporary non-existence. But this is nothing more than what happens as far as we can observe in every case of dreamless sleep. During such a sleep, the self, so far as we know, is unconscious, as unconscious as it could be without a body. Yet, this does not prevent it being the same man who went to sleep and who woke up again. Why should the difficulty be any greater in a change of bodies? And then, have we any reason, after all, to suppose that a body is essential to a self? It seems to me that the facts only support a very different proposition, namely, that while a self has a body that body is essentially connected with the self's mental life. For example, no self can be conceived as conscious unless it has sufficient data for its mental activity. This material is only given as far as our observations can go, in the form of sensations, and sensations again, as far as our observations can go, seem invariably connected with changes in a body. But it does not follow, because a self which has a body cannot get its data except in connection with that body, that it would be impossible for a self without a body to get data in some other way. It may be just the existence of the body which makes these other ways impossible at present. If a man is shut up in a house, the transparency of the windows is an essential condition of his seeing the sky. But it would not be prudent to infer that, if he walked out of the house, he could not see the sky because there was no longer any glass through which he might see it. With regard to the connection of the brain with thought, the chief evidence for it appears to be that diseases or mutilations of the brain affect the course of thought. But this does not prove that, even while a man has a brain, his thoughts are directly connected with it. Many things are capable of disturbing thought, which are not essential to its existence. For example, a sufficiently severe attack of toothache may render all consecutive abstract thought impossible. But, if the tooth was extracted, I should still be able to think. And, in the same way, the fact that an abnormal state of the brain may affect our thoughts does not prove that the normal states of the brain are necessary for thought. Even if the brain is essential to thought while we have bodies, it would not follow 
that when we ceased to have brains, we could not think without them. The same argument applies here as with the organs of sense. It might be that the present inability of the self to think except in connection with the body was a limitation which was imposed by the presence of the body, and which vanished with it. We have now considered the two arguments against the immortality of the self which spring from the death of the body. But we have said nothing as to the bearing on this question of stories as to the ghosts of the dead. Such stories, however numerous and well authenticated, could never give us any positive evidence that the self was undying. At the most, they could prove that it survived its body for a few centuries. But, indirectly, the evidence could be of considerable importance. For it might possibly prove that the self survived the death of its body. Now, the death of its body is by far the strongest reason that we have for doubting the self's immortality. And if the appearance of ghosts could prove that this reason had no weight, they would have removed the greatest difficulty in the way of the belief. Much of the evidence offered on this subject is doubtless utterly untrustworthy. But there is a good deal which investigation has failed to break down. And there is much to be said in support of the view that, after all deductions have been made for fraud, error, and coincidence, there is still a sufficient residuum to justify the belief that such apparitions are, in some cases, caused by the dead man whose body they represent. But the mere proof that there was this causal connection between the dead man and the apparition would not suffice to prove that the dead man had survived his death. A chain of effects may exist long after its original cause is destroyed. Chatham may be one of the chief causes of the pride which England excites in an Englishman today. But this proves nothing as to Chatham's present existence, and, as far as I know, all stories of apparitions would be equally well explained by the theory that a man might, before his death, initiate a chain of circumstances which would cause his apparition to appear, after his death, under certain conditions, to men still alive. In this case, nothing would be proved about his existence after death. This may appear improbable, but, on the other hand, any attempt to prove empirically that man could survive death would have to struggle with such an enormous mass of negative evidence that its antecedent improbability would also not be small. Investigation may give us more evidence and evidence incompatible with any theory except that of survival, but at present it seems to me that we have much more chance of proving our immortality by metaphysics than by psychical research. We now come to the third question. Is there any reason to suppose that myself does not share the transitory character which I recognize in all the material objects around me? What exactly is this transitory character? When science says that a material object, a planet or a human body, ceases to exist, what does it mean? It does not mean that anything is annihilated. It means that units which were combined in a certain way are now combined otherwise. The form has changed, but everything which was there before is there now. We need not inquire whether this distinction between an unchanging matter and a changing form can have more than a rough approximate correctness. It is sufficient to note that the analogy of science, whatever weight may be attached to it, does not give us reason to suppose anything to be transitory except combinations. Footnote. I do not mean to imply that science necessarily accepts any units as indivisible and imperishable. My point is that it tells us that whatever does perish does so only by the separation of the parts of which it is composed. 
those parts may themselves be combinations. Thus, it is possible that they may perish, and so on, ad infinitum. But nothing perishes but combinations. End footnote. Is the self a combination? It certainly resembles a combination in one respect, for it is differentiated and contains a plurality. We can have different sensations at the same moment, and sensations, thoughts, and desires can exist simultaneously. But it does not follow from this that the self is a combination. For if a whole is a combination, it is built up of parts which could exist without being combined in that way, while the combination would not exist without them. If the bricks of a wall, for instance, were destroyed, the wall would be destroyed too. But the wall might be destroyed by being taken to pieces, and the bricks would remain unchanged. Do the parts of the self stand in this relation to it? Could my thoughts, my volitions, my emotions exist isolated or in new combinations when my self had ceased to exist? It seems clear to me, the point is too ultimate for discussion, that they cannot. It is inconceivable that a thought, a sensation, a volition, or an emotion should exist outside of a self. And it is inconceivable that the same thought, sensation, volition, or emotion, which was once part of my mind, could ever be part of somebody else's. The self, we may say, is complex, but not a compound. It has parts, but it is not built up out of them. For while it depends on them, they depend just as much on it. The self, therefore, cannot cease by the separation of its parts, for its parts only exist as united in it, and therefore could not separate from it. If it did cease to exist, it could only be by annihilation. It is not only that the form would have changed, but that the form and content alike would have perished. Now, there is no analogy in science to suggest the probability of this, for science treats nothing as perishable except combinations. This, indeed, does not give us any safe analogy for the persistence of the self. In the first place, there is reason to doubt the absolute validity of the distinction between content and form, which science finds it convenient to make. And, in the second place, the difference between a self and matter is too great for an analogy from one to the other to be very conclusive. But, at any rate, science gives no analogy against us. All this still leaves us very far from a positive assertion of immortality. Even though the death of the body is no argument for the destruction of the self, and the self cannot be decomposed into parts, it is still possible that the self should not be immortal. And this view has been held in many systems of idealism. It may be maintained, for example, that finite individuals only exist to carry out some divine purpose, and that it is possible that an individual may cease to be necessary for such purpose, and so cease to exist. This was Lotz's view. Or again, it may be maintained that there is something contradictory in the idea of a self, which prevents us from regarding it as an adequate expression of reality, and that therefore there is no reason to suppose that any particular self shares the eternity, which is characteristic of true reality. To meet such doubts as these, it would be necessary to construct a complete metaphysical system, we should have to determine what was the general nature of all reality and whether that nature involved the existence of finite selves. And if, in this way, we reached the conclusion that the existence of finite selves was eternally necessary, the conclusion would arise whether each self was eternal or whether, on the other hand, there was an unending succession of transitory selves. 
and if the former alternative were accepted, we should have to consider the relation between eternity and immortality. All that I have endeavored to do here has been to show that the more obvious arguments against immortality, those which have most weight with most people, have no validity. In spite of all arguments, however, the idea that the self cannot be immortal continually returns to us. Reflection may drive it away, but in unreflective moments, it besets us again. We seem so small, and the transitory seems so great. It is always hard, there are times when it seems impossible, to believe that each of us can be a permanent element in a universe in which nations and planets are but momentary shapes. And the belief in immortality seems all the more incredible when we consider many of the believers. Many people believe in it because they wish it to be true, their desires blinding their judgments. Many believe in it on the authority of some religion claiming to be revealed, most of which must, on any hypothesis, be untrustworthy. It is illogical to conclude that a belief cannot be true because it is generally being believed for mistaken reasons. But it is difficult in practice to keep our distrust from spreading from the reasons to the belief. Yet, I think that reasons for the belief in immortality may be found of such strength that they should prevail over all difficulties. Postscript. In the nine years which have passed since I first wrote these pages, I have become more firmly convinced that the nature of reality can be shown to be such as to justify a belief both in immortality and in pre-existence. I hope at some future time to publish my grounds for this conviction as part of a treatise on the general question of the fundamental nature of reality. July 1915